session number five, uh, uh, the, the last but the one session, the role of technology in achieving sustainable development. Um, hopefully, in this session, we will be looking at uh, the, the role of science, technology, and innovation in the post-2015 agenda. Um, as uh, uh, probably you all are aware, science, technology, and innovation is being highlighted by the um, high-level panel's report as, a, as, as something that is important to be embedded within the goals in the 2015 agenda. Now, this is, uh, most people believe that this is a welcome uh, improvement over the, uh, the MDGs where science, technology, and innovation played a very uh, smaller role in some of few of the, the, the goals and targets rather than uh, looking at it from a cross-cutting point of view. So since, since science, technology, and innovation is going to be a cross-cutting th theme uh, across the post-2015 agenda, it is very important uh, for us to understand what are the implications for, for, for the world, for the developing countries, for South Asia. Now, uh, science, technology, and innovation, the rationale behind science, technology, and innovation being one of the key driving forces of uh, post-2015 agenda stems from the fact that uh, the, 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 the development need to shift towards, uh, uh, um, uh, shift towards resource efficient uh, development paradigm. Now, uh, the, it is also the, 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 the assumption that uh, with in the developing countries, uh, for developing countries to shift towards a resource efficient development, uh, science, technology, and uh, innovation needs to come into place. And some of these are already available within the developing countries, and these can be transferred to develop, sorry, de some of the technologies or, or innovations and scientific approaches for resource efficient methods are available in the developed countries and the developing countries need, need uh, these technologies, these innovation in order for them to transform to a resource efficient uh, way of living. Now, the, the key strategy, uh, therefore, the post 2015 agenda talks about to date is technology transfer. Technology transfer as the key means uh, for developing countries to access science, technology, and innovation. Um, it also talks about, in line with the general uh, thinking of uh, post-2015 agenda, it talks about a local agenda, local agenda that should be developed uh, by the key stakeholders, maybe led by the scientists in, the, in, in countries, with other stakeholders involved to identify what are the issues, uh, gaps, uh, um, the technologies that they want to, want to be want uh, uh, transferred in order to address those gaps, and resource availability and infrastructure needs, and also to come out with how to mobilize resources and make investments so that they are ready for technology transfer. So this is the this is what is what it says right now. So there is a local agenda is being developed by 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 the local you know the countries themselves to um, uh, transfer technologies that they want to uh, transfer in order to become a resource efficient uh, economy. Now, this we need to understand a bit more clear, uh, clearer, how does this work for the people in developing countries, particularly for the majority poor in, you know, who are living in, in South Asia or even in developing countries. How does this work? The, here I would like to bring uh, the technology justice concept. Technology justice is the right of the people, right of people to decide, choose, use, and access technologies of their choice to live the life they, they like to live, but without impinging on the right of the other people to do the same. When we say other, it is also the future generation. So we need to understand with technology transfer, are we going to meet these, uh, you know, some of these criteria? Will justice be delivered for the poor people in our part of the world? 
there are some concerns, which I think, given the time, I just want to flag a few things. And we can go into details during the papers as well as in the discussion. Few things I like to highlight is one, one, one important thing is in the past, or right now, uh, the research and development and science and innovation has been, for a for few decades, has been in the hands of the private sector. And understandably, it has been delivering uh, for the wants of the, the, the richer segment of the, of the society, the, the, that market segment of rich people, rather than meeting the needs of the poor. Obviously, because the private sector funding and resource mobilization for research and development has been you know, diminishing, in, not only in, in, in our countries, but also world over. So there is very little public uh, the research and development agenda that is happening in the interest of the public and certainly in the, uh, to identify or address the needs of the poor. So therefore, there is my first concern is, do we actually, the technologies that are available, are these the, are these the right technology to, the, to meet the needs of the poor people in our, our countries and, and the majority in our countries? If so, if not, then why, what should we be uh, uh, doing? So, uh, so uh, can we identify that? Then the second thing is, I think we are going to have a paper on that, but I just want to flag it, the technology transfer itself. You know, it hasn't worked for developing countries in the last five decades or more, right? So without really going into details, the, 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 the post-2015 agenda is recommending the same strategies that has not worked for us in the past, without either very naively or completely ignoring the whole issue because un unless we review the whole thing, it's not probably not going to work for us just because post-2015, uh, you know, development goals say so. But we will hear more about it from the paper. Um, the third uh, point I like to highlight is about the whole, um, you know, green technology, green economy, green growth issue, which I'm sure was discussed yesterday as well, and we will hear also a bit later on from, uh, from the paper. Now, the green growth, green development has, is, uh, is something that came about as, as a result of these Rio discussions in, in the early in the, in the millennium, and some countries are, you know, attempting to move towards that because it's, it's about, you know, green, with green and growth rather than green against the growth, uh, which is all very welcome. We are talking about, you know, attitude changing, resource efficient, production, consumption, sustainable consumption, um, infrastructure, thinking about infrastructure in a very, <coughs> very different way, which is all good when we have the choice of, you know, shifting. But we also, there's the concern within the green economy is for, for also the attention paid to the natural, uh, it's not a concern, it is the, the attention paid to the natural capital and ecosystem services. So, which is very good, you know, ecosystem, natural capital and ecosystem services, natural capital is eroding, and ecosystem services are not delivering the way it should be. So, the strengthening of that is un, un, und, und, undoubtedly needed. But we also have to remember that large number of majority of poor people in our part of the world are also dependent on these um, natural resources, natural resource base, that they, they, they have no other way of living, be it agricultural, you know, agriculture, fisheries, you know, they, are, they, 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 they depend on the natural resource, base. however badly the status may be, they need to have access to it. So, we need to make sure whatever the approach of science, technology, innovation should be inclusive of them rather than, you know, should pre in, uh, exclude them from accessing it because, you know, they're, they're, they're also partly responsible for the status of it. But th that doesn't mean that, they, that we can't find inclusive ways, but whether technology transfer can solve our problem, we need to pay attention to that. Then the other point maybe very quickly is, you know, who takes responsibility for technology transfer? Who, who has, where is the accountability? Not all technology transfers come with responsibility and accountability. And we can quote number of examples from where, you know, technologies, the externalities of technologies that we have adopted over the years is causing problems that, you know, unresolvable problems. That is something we need to understand. Uh, then uh, the, I think finally, I think we need to also look at, you know, I mentioned this when we were talking about, you know, natural, natural resource base, but whether, whether all solution has to come from outside. 
are there, are there, are there no local solutions at all? Because it, that doesn't seem to be you know, being discussed in the agenda. The local solutions for, uh, for specific problems, specific poverty uh, issues and, and, and circumstances have been demonstrated, shown that there are sustainable solutions are available. Um, it's there, but there are two problems with that because the local, these are considered as alternatives, not really the, you know, the solution for the poor. So they're not being mainstreamed or recognized by the main research and development agendas or the scientists who are, you know, products of the, you know, Western type of education system who, 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 who don't very often pay very little attention or completely discard them as, you know, old things. So how do we get them on board and look at some of the viable um, uh, options to be included in our local science and technology agenda and make local science and technology agenda part of that local agenda. So with that few things, I think, you know, there, there's a lot to be, you know, there's more, I think, but uh, that would, you know, give a start to uh, the discussion later on and also give a preamble to what we are going to discuss here. So with that, I would like to invite our first uh, uh, presenter, Mr. K. M. Gopakumar is the legal advisor and senior researcher um, of Third World Network. Um, and uh, his paper is on transfer of technology and IPR, which is obviously a very important issue when we are talking about science, technology, and innovation in the post-2015 agenda. Over to you, Mr. Gopakumar. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I, I completely agree with and endorse all the caveats uh, 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 Madam Vishaga has mentioned uh, related to the technology transfer. It's not just plug and play, and uh, you need a lot of local adaptation at times, or you have to find your own solutions. <coughs> but having said this, uh, my focus would be um, by and large on, uh, on the role of uh, intellectual property rights in the technology transfer. I think it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, could be the light. So, yeah, the PowerPoint does not straight away work. You need a local adaptation. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, by the way, uh, while uh, they fix this uh, issue, um, I mean, I take this uh, opportunity to thank the organizers uh, as, you know, for including this topic uh, as part of the symposium. Um, and, uh, and also, uh, because it's, uh, you know, in a way, it's a much more marginalized topic, even though very uh, uh, crucial issue for uh, developing countries in the last uh, 50 years or so. Um, and um, my scheme of presentation goes like this. I'll, I'll take uh, just to a few minutes to refresh your memory on the technology transfer uh, uh, dis uh, debates in the international forums. Then I'll move on uh, to focusing on the role of uh, science, technology, in, and innovation in achieving MDGs or in the MDG context. And third, early I look at um, uh, how the current state of play with regard to uh, technology transfer, in, uh, especially in the post-2015 uh, processes. And lastly, uh, uh, I look at uh, uh, the role of IPR in, uh, in technology transfer. And I, want, uh, I would like to do all these things in another uh, nine minutes or so. Um, I think it's a wrong blue color we put it in. <laughs> <laughs> Probably if uh, you give me two minutes from there, try to change that. Is it your blue color or is the PowerPoint? I think it's a oh, that's there it. There you are. Yeah, that's better. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, so uh, this technology is uh, uh, is basically technology transfer is identified an uh, important issue f uh, in the post uh, colonial uh, period, immediate in the post war period. Um, uh, so there was a lot of efforts went on uh, to uh, to create an uh, international regime on technology transfer on equitable uh, uh, terms. Um, 
so this, uh, there, are, there were three main efforts, uh, uh, starting with the International Code of Conduct on Technology Transfer, then Code of Conduct on Transnational Corporations, and also renegotiation of Paris Convention. So these were the three negotiations which, uh, you know, uh, 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 which went on like more than two decades, uh, but uh, ended abruptly without any concrete uh, result. However, now if you look at the uh, provisions on technology transfer, uh, we would find many international instruments having this technology transfer provisions. So the entire drive is a compendium of uh, international instruments containing technology transfer. I think it lists more than 48 uh, multilateral instruments. Uh, uh, containing technology transfer provisions, but most of these provisions are, people call it like endeavor clauses, which uh, does not have enough uh, um, legal, uh, does not create enough legal obligation, but there are provisions which having concrete legal obligations, like the UNFCC, where say that the obligation on the part of developing countries is uh, based on a condition of technology transfer and finance. So th there are international instruments uh, containing this. Now let me move to what uh, the, the uh, uh, what what's our under understanding with re uh, regard to technology transfer. Generally speaking, the process of technology uh, cal development capabilities achieved in three phases. That's the historical evidence shows that the first phase is the uh, e uh, imitation stage, where uh, where the technology. Uh, uh, initiation stage where the technology as capital good is imported and the second stage you have uh, internalization stage where the local firms learn through the imitation under flexible IP regime and third the local firms and inst uh, institutions innovate through their own uh, research and development invest in other words the domestic technological development capabilities start with first accessing the technology secondly you emulate the technology and third you innovate, and lastly, you invent. So this is the pathway for uh, uh, you know building your technological capability. So when we call it technology transfer, it does not mean just plug and play. You just get the uh, 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 get the mission and uh, keep uh, starting it. So it's basically technology transfer means to enable you to move up to the stage of innovation. So and uh, so for this purpose, enabling uh, you need an enabling policy environment. Uh, uh, which existing capabilities of country in many areas in order to in order to uh, facilitate technology transfer or in order to use the technology transfer in a good uh, way. So you need an infrastructure, education, research and development institutions, laws and regulations, human resource, finance, entrepreneurship, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But intellectual property right is the important component. I would flag it because it's related to the uh, policy space. You do not have. Uh, enough policy space when it comes to intellectual property rights. But human resource development, as far as your uh, research and development policies are concerned, you can, uh, you have enough policy space. You can say that all the uh, engineers should also study the sociology. Uh, so you can have that kind of uh, policies. You can frame such policies. But when it comes to intellectual property rights, you are obliged by uh, certain international norms which came through the uh, WTO, uh, uh, the final act of uh, WTO, um, uh, primarily known as the TRIPS Agreement. On the, during the last 50 years or so, there is a lot of change happened in the technology uh, uh, landscape is concerned. The first important change I would say is that it's in the private control. The technology is by and large in the capabilities in the private uh, control and the hands of private corporation, unlike the uh, say 50s and 60s where there was uh, technology was much in the hands of uh, the public sector. So the green revolution is an uh, is an important example. Uh, so I'll come back to that later. And second is the less policy space, less policy space for the developing countries when it comes to uh, uh, comes to uh, force or to or even to persuade an actor uh, to have a technology transfer. Earlier we used to have. Uh, performance requirements as part of your industrial uh, policy, uh, which insist you for technology transfer. But this kind of policy, our local content rule, basically you impose the investor to have a local content rule. These, uh, there are limitations to that uh, because of the TRIPS agreement, as well as the TRIPS agreement. TRIPS agreement imposes an minimum standard of intellectual property protection. So you cannot have the imitation uh, strategy. You, you won't be able to follow the imitation strategy in a, in a smooth way. 
you have to do much more effort to do that. But uh, on a positive side, uh, access to information is much more available right now. So you have uh, on internet, you can get materials, even you can uh, get scientific journals, etc. But there is one component where, uh, uh, which is going to uh, control the um, uh, control the inf use of information. You have you might be having access of, to information, but you may not be able to use that information effectively because of intellectual property rights. Now we are also talking about global value chain where the uh, different components will be produced at the low-cost destinations and get assembled at various places. So this in a way, per, you know, in a way result in kind of percolation of uh, 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 technology from a centralized firm to many uh, small firms. But IPR is the key, where in which you control the uh, technology or control the, uh, you have this, uh, what you call the uh, key uh, to the technologies through uh, 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 through intellectual property rights. So in a way, I would say that uh, in the last 50 years, what we have seen, the constant effort by the developed countries to kick away the ladder. The most of the developed countries, um, not most, all the developed countries use the same way, imitation, uh, innovate, and in, uh, invent. Uh, this pathway has been, uh, uh, has been denied to uh, uh, developed countries. So how many more minutes I have? Oh, five minutes, okay. So on technology, <laughs> fine, so I, I, I can finish actually. Um, uh, technology and uh, MDG is concerned, if you look at all the MDG uh, goals, uh, you know, all seven MDGs, I'm not uh, 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 going to uh, make a comment on the uh, last uh, goal. Everything is to te technology. If you have uh, access to technology, you can always uh, uh, achieve the goals in a much uh, easier manner. Uh, but what's happening is that when you look at the targets, you find only in the goal eight, within the partnership framework, you find the access to technologies. So you don't find, like on HIV AIDS or even the reproductive health side, you don't find any target on access to technology. So this is, a, uh, this is an issue. This is a kind of a, a limitation on access to, um, uh, limitation on, uh, on, on the MDG's approach to technology. The Millennium Task Force has spelled uh, the Task Force Millennium Project Task Force spell out uh, uh, you know whatever uh, what all you are required to do to have a sound science, technology, and innovation policy. So I'm not going to that on uh, technology debates in post 2015. We start from Rio uh, outcome documents. Then there is HLP report which has been referred. Um, our HLP report uh, um, you know, stresses technology needs for in the, uh, in the context of uh, growth as well as on, uh, on in the context of partnership. Then there are two think pieces uh, uh, brought by various UN uh, agencies on, uh, on, on, on the role of technology. And we, we also have uh, sustainable development goal process and this process is going to examine this issue you know, on 7th and, and 9th and 10th of December, the coming days. Uh, in the in the next months, so on IPR and uh, uh, t uh, on uh, transfer of technology, I I would like to just read uh, two statements. One from the committee on uh, uh, development policy, which has uh, uh, clearly mentioned in its uh, submission to the ECOSOC uh, process, saying that the intellectual property uh, regime is uh, hindering the technology uh, transfer. Uh, and there is also a UNDP commission, Global Commission on HIV AIDS, which calls for a moratorium on, uh, on the implement, uh, on, uh, on TRIPS agreement. And it asks for a com comprehensive review of the TRIPS agreement, to, uh, uh, comprehensive review of the TRIPS agreement. So, uh, I'm, I'm, so as far as the uh, post 2015 agenda is concerned, there are two approaches, two more minutes I'll take. Uh, two approaches. One set of people, I would say that IP maximalist approach, they say that you can achieve the development goals by protecting intellectual property rights. This is very visible if you look at this secre UN Secretary General's report to ECOSOC. Then other set of uh, people like UNTAD, in a way, that you should be cautious, you should have a balanced approach to IP. You, your development uh, needs should be, uh, uh, should not be compromised for, uh, you know, uh, for providing intellectual property protection. So in terms of conclusion, what I would say that access to technology should not be figured as a partnership issue. It should be figured as a target for uh, whatever goal we are agreeing, especially in the case of there should be a technology component when we are talking about growth and employment. This is very important. Uh, and also make the IP subservient to the development agenda because you want to have development end of the day. And 
and also promote the use of flexibilities to achieve post-2015 agenda. And lastly, I'll, I'll, I'll take uh, the, uh, jump to the last point. What's the justification for uh, justification for uh, intellectual property protection. It is because the private sector wants to invest on research and development, so they want to have a guarantee to recoup their investment. So there is no theoretical or empirical evidence uh, to support this idea because there are market failures. When it comes to the uh, uh, diseases like the tropical diseases or the needs of developing countries, research are not happening even though you have uh, all kind of intellectual property protection. So there is a market failure and there is ample evidence to that. So what we have to do when it comes to the development goals, whatever you are going to agree, uh, we are going to agree in the coming days is what we require is a public investment and that investment should uh, be based on a principle of delinking. What, 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 what you mean by delinking is the dealing the cost of R&D from the price of the product. So you can have you can ensure access. So you don't impose huge prices on the R&D products uh, in order to charge the uh, in order to recoup the R&D investment. So we don't repeat the disasters which we witnessed in the last decade when it uh, du you know, during the HIV AIDS crisis in Africa. So pr the prices of the products can brought down to the affordable level and you can reach out to the people. The success of the main uh, success when it comes to HIV AIDS is mainly the availability of the medicine at an affordable cost. This is made possible because there was that point of time there was policy space in India under the Indian Patent Act there was no product patent protection which allowed the Indian companies to come out with the low cost medicines which basically revolutionized the treatment. So this is, could be the way forward. Let me stop. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for you know, giving us that insights on technology transfer. So we need to really think about what we would be doing about it in the post-2015 agenda. Right, so let's, let's move on to the next paper. Uh, next paper is by Mr. Sudeep Bhattacharya. Uh, he's the program officer of uh, South Asia Watch on Trade, Economic and Environment, Swati. Uh, his work is, uh, his paper is on diaspora and green economy in South Asia. So over to you, Sudeep. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so like uh, we have already mentioned, uh, like Mr. Gopa, Gopa Kumar already mentioned, the importance of technology transfer and the contentious issue of IPR related to it. So my approach will be a little different. I'll look at what are the options. So we already have the problem, what could be a possible solution? Uh, so this is like a, to begin with, right, we have uh, the, the post-2050 development agenda. So how does that, uh, and we have, the, we have already had a discussion on sustainability, environmental impact, and so forth. So how do, they, how do the two concepts relate? What do we do now, right? So we know that Millennium, Millennium Development Goals have been a noteworthy developmental effort at the national and uh, uh, reg regional level, at like global level as well, right? But we, know, we also know that the social economic progress has been uneven within and across countries. Also, in the meantime, environmental degradation has continued and continues to worsen. And uh, so overall, we can say that Millennium Development Goals have significantly contributed, have, made, have failed to make contribution towards sustainable development goals. Uh, and in the meantime, especially for the case of South Asia, climate change is threatening to push millions back into poverty. And in some way even reverse the achievements already made in terms of uh, millennial development goals so far. So there is a need to link MDGs with S SDGs. Uh, and in this regard, the green economy framework can actually bridge the economic and sustainability pillars of development and which we have all been looking for. What is the answer? So this could be a possible answer, answer of green economy. However, we need to realize that the co transition to green economy, especially for countries like in South Asia, is not going to be cost free. However, if the post-2015 development agenda can actually support the countries uh, who, who decide to pursue it, I mean, that could go, go a long way in encouraging uh, the South Asian transition into a greener economy. Now, let's talk about technology transfer and how it fits into the concept of green economy. But basically, there's no denying that transition into a green economy will require technology transfer, mainly green technologies, environmentally friendly technologies. Unfortunately, though, South Asia lacks access to these available green technologies. Uh, in the meanwhile, ownership of available green technology is highly skewed to the north, so to the developed countries. And uh, given the issue of IPR, uh, technology transfer to developing countries, and in the case of South Asia as well, has been very limited. 
And uh, also due to IPRs, the international focus has now shifted towards providing funding incentive for technology transfer to developing so to develop countries. And among one of the most uh, uh, popular in, uh, financial mechanism is the clean development mechanism uh, for uh, enabling, facilitating technology transfer to developing countries. Unfortunately though, uh, the CDM projects, uh, is, it, is it is reported that less than half of the projects implemented actually involve technology transfer. More importantly, the, tech the CDM projects mainly focus on hardware. Transfer of hardware basically means uh, infrastructures and so forth, and, uh, basically in black box technology, rather than and neglect the more important software, which includes know-how of the technology, you know, uh, maintenance, skill development, entrepreneurial support, and so forth. Also, uh, the international negotiations on climate change have taught thus far focused on mitigation technologies as to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But in South Asia, the, climate, the effects of climate change are already visible. And what we need more than mitigation technologies is, is adaptation technologies to reduce our vulnerability and to enhance our resilience to the changing climate. So now the, uh, another issue is that South Asian countries lack technology absorption capacity. What this basically means is that even if there is technology transfer, we are not able to uh, customize it to fit our own needs. So in this regard, it's very important that technology transfer is also accompanied by the transfer of uses, maintenance, and in-depth understanding of the transfer technology so that if it doesn't work, you can actually ch make changes. So this was the case in India when they imported uh, wind, uh, wind technology uh, from Europe, but when they brought it to India, it, it, it didn't work because of the wind pattern, the temperature, because it, it was designed differently. So in this regard, if you don't have the capacity to actually innovate, you make use of the transfer technology, it's useless, basically. So uh, in this regard, it also it is important to blend technology transfer with uh, indigenous knowledge and technology for easy absorption. So if you have local technologies which are easy, there's no e easy low adaptation cost, that could also go a long way. And uh, uh, in this regard, the focus has to be IP irrelevant technologies, because they do exist. So we have technologies that are IP are protected, but there are, there are uh, methods like drip irrigation, floating gardens, you know, pico hydropower, and also rainwater harvesting. These are not protected by IPR, but they can still go a long way in helping the region cope with the effects that's already happening. So then comes the issue, like how do we facilitate the technology transfer? Right? We all know that we need technology, and they have the issue of IPR. One possible solution to look at could be the diaspora, because South Asia is one of the main source of migrants in the world, right? Every annually, 1.5 million migrants from South Asia migrate to other parts of the world. And nearly 40% of those migrants actually go to the north, so US, Europe, and so forth. In this regard, it's important to see diaspora not just as brain uh, drain, but rather as brain gain, because you could actually foster, no you could harness knowledge from the diaspora for development, right? Uh, also, diaspora can also serve as reputational and cultural intermediaries and connect home countries with FDI or foreign investment. And this was the case in India where the success of Indian diaspora in Silicon Valley actually uh, facilitated the inflow of FDI in uh, India's ICD sector, which is now booming, right? Also, uh, diaspora entrepreneurs can s uh, steer business ventures and investment in origin countries. Again, example of India where in 2004, 19 out of top 20 Indian software businesses were founded or managed by diaspora members. Another, now, b besides this, the more, uh, the, the, the ways of technology that is not really uh, common is the common, uh, 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 like diaspora knowledge networks. We have professional associations as well. There's, there's the idea of distance teaching and then temporary placement in original countries and also the return of migrants with enhanced skills from abroad, right? So among these, one of the more focus has to be, uh, will be in this presentation on diaspora knowledge networks, because this has gained some uh, success in, uh, especially in India. So one of the most prominent or the successful one is the diaspora networks called the Indian Indus Entrepreneurs, formed by Silicon Valley entrepreneurs in 1992. So they basically foster entrepreneurship through mentoring programs by industry experts, uh, which are usually diaspora members, right? Also, they have, a, they, have a, uh, they have a branch called the Bangalore Special Interest Group, and this is dedicated to clean technology. Uh, facilitates mentoring, networking, you know, discussion, and forming alliances and joint ventures in terms of clean technology, wind, you know, waste management, and so forth. So this is like a success story. So this, why, why don't we try more to actually replicate something like these other countries as well in a larger scale? Uh, also, we, have, uh, we need to acknowledge that there is high inter-regional migration within Southeast, uh, South Asia. A lot of people you know, go to India. 
So in this regard, India has a uh, major role to play within the transfer of technology within the region, because India is actu actually leading uh, uh, technology te uh, development of green technology, mainly in solar and wind power, right? So in, in 2008, in India, they launched the Lighting a Billion Lives initiatives, which has thus far replaced kerosene lamps with clean solar power, solar lamps in 35,000 uh, rural households. And given the success, it has actually been, it's, it's in the process of uh, replication in Uganda, of all places, and it's not the, the same in, in within the region. So we have a model that did get some success, but it's not being you know, circulated within the, within the region. Uh, uh, also, there are other, other techniques that are available within the region. Uh, so the use of improved cooking stoves and floating gardens in Bangladesh. There's also the Pico Hydro project in Sri Lanka. Uh, we have, you know, eco green tourism in Nepal, Bhutan, and so forth. So these are also these ideas of knowledge and technology that can actually be shared within the region. If, instead of waiting for, you know, the, the West to help out, we should take an initiative and you make use of what we have already in this regard. So now we know that this can be done, but how do we engage the diaspora? Because they're not going to just be, you know, it's, it's for me difficult for them to, we need to have some policies, we need to have some initiatives, efforts to actually engage the diaspora. So one of them, uh, Realizing the potential of diaspora now, recently efforts have been undertaken in South Asia. South Asia. So one of the uh, in, uh, initiative was the initiatives implemented by India's Ministry of Science and Technology. They basically had uh, various schemes to attract Indian scientists working abroad to pursue research in India. Also, India's new science, technology, and innovation policy aims to stimulate domestic R&D, but through collaborative research. Uh, this is the case with India and Great Britain. Also, Germany is also getting into action, on, uh, uh, not to mention uh, Russia as well. Uh, also, there is uh, the National Science Foundation Sri Lanka uh, uh, has recently organized a global forum for Sri Lankan scientists to facilitate, facilitate knowledge transfer within Sri Lanka. Also, uh, however, besides these initiatives, we also need a legal framework to provide uh, incentives to the diaspora to actually engage. Uh, one of such initiatives could be the flexible citizenship laws uh, mainly dual citizenship. And so far, only Bangladesh, Maldives, and Pakistan actually have a concept of dual citizenship. And uh, Sri Lanka is in the process, uh, however, to you know, implement that act as well. Another way could be uh, reducing income tax rates for citizens who have worked abroad. Uh, this was the uh, case in Malaysia, uh, where tax exemptions and flat income tax uh, of 15% was given for five, five years to attract skilled labor to come back into the country. Uh, also, uh, more important to engage is to strengthen the, strengthen the coordination across the various stakeholders that have been uh, private initiatives, you know, government uh, efforts as well to coordinate them so that we have a, a greater impact. So in conclusion, uh, what do we know? Uh, we know that South Asia desperately needs uh, transfer of clean technology, uh, not to mention adaptation and mitigation methods as well. Uh, and in this regard, South Asia should take advantage of its diaspora. Uh, also, countries should support knowledge sharing and enhance networks, uh, joint research projects, and so forth uh, for the transfer of technology. Uh, and in the meantime, government should provide a legal framework uh, to help that process. And uh, the, the first step towards uh, engaging the diaspora could be data gathering, because uh, we significantly lack data about what uh, the capabilities of our diaspora. So in this regard, it's important for us to survey the human resources available within our diaspora so that we can harness it better and more efficiently. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sudeep, for that uh, presentation, which gives us uh, at least one idea of way forward uh, to think about and work on. So let's move now to the, uh, before we begin the discussion, i like to invite three discussants. Let me start by, uh, first by inviting Dr. Saman Kalegama. Uh, he's the Executive Director of Institute of Policy Studies, Sri Lanka. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, both presents, uh, presentations were excellent. I must congratulate the two speakers. Uh, starting with the first presentation, uh, the main argument of Kopa Kumar uh, was that the tight intellectual property right regimes are an impediment to technology transfer. That is the bottom line. And uh, uh, <coughs> therefore, we have to look at ways and means we could uh, get better technology transfer. And he came up with certain recommendations delinking R&D expenditure uh, with the price of product, so on and so forth. But what I would like to uh, uh, emphasize 
uh, here is that uh, let us look uh, why this type of a TRIPS intellectual property regime has come about. I think if one looks at the uh, whole uh, 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 trade uh, uh, rules and regulations, one sees that uh, when the Uruguay round discussions were going on, trade was categorized into three areas, trade in goods, trade in services, and trade in ideas. And the developed countries were of the view that they were gradually losing the comparative advantage on cheap labor-based products. And their comparative advantage lie in knowledge-based, uh, intellectual property-based, innovation-based uh, products. And if there is a soft intellectual property regime, that very soon they will lose the comparative advantage in that area also. So, that was the rationale of the whole TRIPS agreement. Because as all of us know, uh, before TRIPS came into the WTO agenda, uh, the Uruguay round was a fait accompli. I mean, most of the rules and regulations of the TRIPS agreement were designed by the strong corporate sector, the multinationals, who were controlling uh, bulk of these uh, intellectual property rights. So they this uh, tight regime. So, uh, what does the historical experience show, as very correctly pointed out by Gopakuma? Uh, the softer intellectual property right regimes facilitate uh, better technology transfer, innovation, and of course the uh, indigenous uh, entrepreneurs uh, coming up with new products, which works towards uh, uh, the uh, entire development process. And the examples you highlighted, uh, India's uh, paid, uh, product Patent Act of uh, 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 1970, which uh, 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 for pharmaceutical products, then the process patenting, which was uh, only for seven years for pharmaceuticals, all that facilitated the flexibility of intellectual property rights, the uh, reverse engineering process, producing pharmaceuticals at a cheaper price. And other developing countries have benefited from the cheaper pharmaceuticals that are in fact produced uh, in India. Uh, similarly, Korea benefited from the softer intellectual property uh, uh, rights. But the trip, uh, TRIPS agreement does not uh, permit this to happen. And that is why the United Nations, the statement that Gopakumar uh, quoted, uh, clearly comes out saying that, you know, the human interests are not taken uh, into account. Another aspect so, uh, of Koba's uh, paper, which he did not touch upon the, uh, in your presentation, is the ho how many developed countries, uh, when uh, developing countries go into an agreement, how these intellectual property rights are embedded into those agreements, so that uh, uh, the developing countries are compelled to follow a, a WTO uh, plus uh, type of uh, uh, intellectual property regime. Now, uh, a clear example can be given from Sri Lanka. Uh, in, 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 in 2003, Sri Lanka was uh, negotiating a bilateral FTA with USA because there were worries that after 2004, with the multi-fiber uh, arrangement coming to an end, that market access to the US, uh, uh, USA will be reduced. Uh, so uh, better market access through the free trade agreement, and the industrialists were pushing it. But one of the conditions U USA to Sri Lanka was that in your intellectual property rights should be WT, you should drop compulsory licensing pharmaceuticals, you should uh, uh, drop parallel importation, so on and so forth. So entirely WTO plus conditions and this was challenged by the Center for Policy Alternatives when the draft bill came and then uh, the amendments had to be uh, uh, brought about. The Supreme Court agreed with the uh, when the, uh, the bill was challenged and uh, we b went back to uh, a more um, a human oriented uh, intellectual property right regime. So all in all, I mean, I, uh, and also you referred to in bi bilateral investment agreements also, these intellectual property rights are being uh, brought in. Uh, so through a different trade route, when you can't bring it through the multilateral WTO system, you, uh, you try to bring in these tight intellectual property rights through different trade routes like the bilateral free trade agreements between the North and the South countries. So 
given this fact, we have to uh, come with a uh, more innovative way of handling these intellectual property rights. And this is precisely what the Doha development agenda, the revisions that the developing countries have uh, suggested, uh, uh, have incorporated, incorporating more policy space, taking into account the development dimension, so on and so forth. But the Doha development agenda is not moving because it's a single uh, undertaking. I mean, all have to agree in, on all uh, these things, uh, areas like intellectual property rights. Uh, there is no consensus uh, whatsoever at this uh, uh, juncture. So this is uh, some a very serious a uh, area that needs to be re-looked re at uh, for the post-2015 agenda. Now coming to the second paper, uh, basically I am in agreement with you, uh, the need to, uh, your main argument is that uh, fine, even if there is pro uh, technology transfer, uh, you have to have adaptation and for there the knowledge tr uh, transfer element is important. So in that context, uh, the diaspora can play a ma major role, the networks, you refer to the overseas uh, Indian, uh, this thing and the Malaysian uh, 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 return expatriate program and so on and so forth, brain gain programs in some other countries. Uh, yes, the, uh, the diaspora can uh, play a prominent role, but you see getting the diaspora involved in uh, mm, mm, uh, the whole technology transfer process, uh, especially with reference to green technology, uh, which you were talking about, is not an easy exercise because uh, if I am to speak about Sri Lanka, soon after the war ended in 2000, there was quite a lot of optimism in this country that the diaspora will come in a big way and participate in science and technology matters, uh, reconstruction and uh, redevelopment uh, uh, areas, etc., etc. It did not happen in the way we uh, envisaged. In fact, uh, at one time before going in, uh, to the IMF for the loan, Sri Lanka was uh, uh, heavily dependent on diaspora contributing to some of the treasury bonds which we were floating in the international market, which did not take place in the way we anticipated. So even for the diaspora to uh, uh, engage, you had to create the conducive policy environment. Some of the uh, policies you highlighted like dual citizenship and tax breaks, etc. But uh, you see, uh, I would like to quote uh, some steps that India had taken in the context of uh, mobilizing diaspora. Since 2003, uh, there is an annual event called Pravasi Bharatya Divas. That is uh, the bringing the entire Indian diaspora to the country. It includes the pe people of Indian origin and also uh, non-resident Indians. Uh, then they have the annual report on diaspora uh, in the sense that with their specialized fields, etc., which the Center for Policy, uh, uh, Center for Development Studies in Kerala produces. So uh, I think these are some of the areas that one, my time is up, so these are some of the areas that one has to look at in the context of, uh, you know, uh, more uh, diaspora mobilization uh, to link them uh, for more effective knowledge transfer and thereby technology transfer. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kalegam, for that. And uh, let's move to the next uh, discussant, Dr. Anand Malavatantri. Uh, Dr. Malavatantri is the Assistant Resident Representative, Environment and Energy, United Nations Development Program, UNDP. Dr. Malavatantri. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I like to position uh, myself uh, actually the con same context that we started yesterday, which is like how we prepare ourselves as a country to uh, fit the post-2015 agenda. So how d what are the systems that we should bring into the dialogue? In that process, what I would like to try within this uh, five, six minutes is uh, to uh, use the two papers plus things discussed here. And also two examples from Sri Lanka that we have been experiencing the positives and negatives of technology transfer. Um, one thing I think, uh, the moment you think about technology transfer, the mind goes like, okay, a technique comes to and then do a production. Something, I mean, that, that uh, notion you get first into your mind. But when you think about it, technology deals with many more. I mean, for example, now, all post-2015 mechanisms and the fundings associated with that will need like very extensive monitoring systems in a country. 
Now, for example, how much carbon the certain forest will absorb, how much footprint that particular uh, intervention reduced. Now, that requires extensive technology transfer on system establishment. And the second part, in the countries, we have tons and tons of data. Now, if you take Sri Lanka, we have a department, we have a irrigation, we have so many people having data, central bank. Uh, so, now, can we access all that to our work? Or can we access that to the post-2015 process? Are these systems are compatible? Do we need the broker systems to read those material and bring it to the the same data systems that the global community uses. Now that needs heavy duty technology transfer. Then, how prepared a countries are in the negotiations? That itself is a technology, because that needs a lot of knowledge and then techniques to do that. Then there comes to another level, where again another set of technologies. I'm just talking about mechanisms that are needed to put in place to make the system work, to make countries prepare to do the post-2015 work. The second part, when it comes to countries, now there are a lot of uh, myths, I think few of them I think I can highlight. One is like we talked about economic growth. Sometimes we pollute, make people sick, and sell drugs. And that sales of drugs and the production and the whole thing get contributed as economic growth. How do you deal in that two pieces? That needs a bit detail. But there are a lot of models, there are a lot of knowledge outside. Can we bring some of those? Another quick example is, if you take Sri Lanka, can someone say like, what's the best land use for the central hills, fragile central hills? It is used for irrigation, agriculture, drinking, name it, and then to give to the water of the north. So that links right back to conflict if the water is not there. So that also, we have, there are a lot of models developed by outside, like you can have hydrologic modeling, all kind of things that can brought in. That's another area. Then, talked about the, uh, the negotiations. Then there are systems that you can put in place to uh, do this technology transfer. I think we have been beneficial of some of those technology transfers in Sri Lanka as well. One example I can cite is that uh, Sri Lankan uh, wind energy development, which was a direct technology transfer that involves Central uh, Ceylon Electricity Board and a uh, utility in uh, United States. But those things take time. Now, can we design systems that will take time in that post-2015 system to expose that technical people who are users to those technologies. It's not like a policy maker going and seeing and seeing like, okay, let's do that back in my country. But can we use that? I think what happened in the Ceylon Electricity Board case, that's exactly that. The technologists were able to get convinced the wind power addition to Sri Lankan grid is possible. And then the follow-up actions took about six years. Now only we are seeing the process started in 2002. There are other negative impacts in the technology. So also sometimes people get carried away. You can introduce like a very high technology in a very small piece of area and then say, okay, Sri Lanka did it or this country did it. But can you upscale it? It's a whole different ball game, upscaling technology. So how do you match it? I can, I can cite one example in Sri Lanka, the technology carried away a good uh, opportunity the solid waste management in Colombo. There was technology, there was a largest composting facility in South Asia was operating in the middle of Colombo doing 300 metric tons of solid waste co to composting. But there were technologies thrown in like we can do incineration, we can do energy, we can do a lot of other things, uh, pyrolysis. So all our scientists ran to different countries and came with these ideas. All you needed was 300 metric tons, Columbus generating 600 metric tons, all you needed was another parallel line. Simple. But pyrolysis, energy, 
all kind of things came and messed it. Now uh, that was sold into scrap iron. So that that's how we sustain technology. So then you had to have systems in countries that also not only the transfer but also the sustainability of the technologies. Then I would like to uh, uh, touch upon one couple of things that uh, Dr. Idel uh, Vishaka mentioned. Only the private sector has technology, probably not. I know there are so many military systems, so many space systems owned by governments. A teeny release of some of those can make a big difference in the world. Some of those satellite mapping which we used in uh, Sri Lankan wind map was Department of Energy wind profiles done in miles and miles above, projected downward. Some of the fertilizer spreading can be done on, on a precision farming. All needed high remote sensing technologies that are available in the military and the space domain. So though, like there are IPR, I think uh, was mentioned, there are non-IPR technologies that you can promote a lot. What you need is good knowledge bases that will share all these ideas. So those are some of the things that uh, ties up with the general discussion and these papers. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Valvathanthi. And let's move to the final discussion, Mr. Dilipa Vitarana. Dilipa is a senior lecturer in the Open University. Uh, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, I will, uh, my intervention, uh, in my intervention, I will uh, actually focus uh, on two main points regarding the two papers. So uh, firstly, uh, when it comes to uh, Gopakumar's paper, uh, I will, I want to focus on uh, the idea of flexibility you were talking about. And uh, I think even though the, the, the kind of international uh, IPR regime is so strict and it consists of, you know, uh, several instruments, still there are you know a lot of flexibilities available and uh, I, I think one key issue we need to focus on is the the non-use of these flexibilities in our local uh, IPR regimes now there is a good, good study done by uh, the consumers in international comparing uh, IPR laws in 11 Asia Pacific countries and at the open university we expanded that to Sri Lanka as well and they are what I mean, one of the conclusions is that, you know, a lot of these flexibilities are not used in, in the local laws. Now, if I give, uh, for example, I mean, there are flex, I mean, when, when, we, talk, when we say flexibility, it, it means you can use all these, you know, IPR products without the consent of the right holder for several purposes. So one such uh, flexibility that is available is for teaching. I mean, for teaching purposes, you don't have to consult the right holder, right? So there is another flexibility for study, research, and experimentation. There's another flexibility for national interest as uh, uh, reflected by compulsory licensing uh, kind of uh, you know, requirement. And then importing from cheaper sources. Freedom to limit protection provided by copyrights. Like, you know, there are, there are several flexibilities. Now, uh, now, if you go through that, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the conclusions of the study, I mean, a lot of countries have not used these flexibilities. And when it comes to Sri Lanka, I think, uh, fortunately, uh, as uh, Dr. Kalegama mentioned, people went to the Supreme Court. And uh, as a result of that, the patent regime is, to a, to a certain extent, fine. But when it comes to the copyright law, the Sri Lankan copyright law is really bad. It's so strict. And if you really, I mean, implement the copyright regime well, uh, the higher education system will find it very difficult to function and even can collapse. So, uh, so I think uh, uh, if I give one example now, uh, I know uh, I think we all know that you know when we want to take a photocopy of you know a book, you know a useful one. I mean we all are using yeah like academics uh, you know and the students. You go to a library and uh, you know you will not be able to get the whole book photocopy it, I mean, because our, our, <laughs> our law says that, you know, only a small part can be photocopied for teaching or research purposes. I mean, why, the, why, why, why we have included that in our, our copyright law? Because if you, if you take, for example, Indonesia, Malaysia, or Philippines, you know, for teaching and research purposes, you can use the whole, whole, whole work. 
So I think one uh, one suggestion I can make is that you know we need to revisit, as uh, it is mentioned in the previous session, that uh, we need to think of uh, Right to Information Act. Another aspect we need to think of is to amend our our especially the copyright law. Uh, and I would uh, again uh, would like to ask the opinion of uh, uh, you, uh, Mr. Gopakuma, of uh, now. Okay, you can as a as a uh, I mean in in negotiations you can try to negotiate you know the best possible frameworks, but still uh, can as individual country countries also like implement things even as country blocks. Now, one thing I would like to ask from you is like for example, environmentally sound technologies. So can we can a country use with without the consent of the right holder? environmentally sound uh, technologies within your country, maybe by using compulsory, compulsory licensing uh, clause, or maybe including that as a EST excep exception. You can include a new exception. I, I would like to know your opinion. And then uh, maybe a kind of a development exception. Uh, that Can't that be implemented as a country block, developing country block? Because I mean, if you if you wait for the in the consensus of the entire you know uh, discussion uh, forum, you will I don't know it's rather tough, right? So what are the what are the possibilities available as individual countries and maybe as you know developing country blocks for us to use the kind of available uh, you know international flexibilities in, in international frameworks and you know incorporate some of the uh, flexibilities we would like to have. And then uh, when it comes to the second paper, uh, I would like to take the Sri Lankan experience to take that discussion a little bit forward. Now, uh, if we talk about uh, diaspora groups, I think we have three categories of diasporas when it comes to Sri Lanka. First category can be the people who have left the country as a result of uh, ethnic intolerance and the religious intolerance of the of the society of the society so if we take that particular group diaspora group uh, uh, it consists of uh, you know a lot of tamil 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 people and uh, i think that uh, you know they they started leaving the country especially during 1980s and it it continues and i think uh, as a result of the recent events now the Muslim uh, communities also started leaving uh, professionals, and you know uh, uh, they are they have also started leaving. So uh, they kind of uh, consist a bulk of this first category, like you know people who leave as a result of intolerance, and then there is the second category, uh, of where people leave as a result of intolerance of dissent. Uh, and then it is uh, the intolerance of dissent of the society as well as the government, and as a result of lack of democratic space. So that I would like to see as the second category, and all, all communities are included in that category, and uh, I think Sinhala people consists uh, uh, of a kind of a significant percentage of that. And then the third category is the, the group of people who leave the country for better state of status of living for economic reasons, for financial reasons. So uh, maybe most of them can be, you know, can be single is in my guess, right? So there are all these three categories of people. And uh, when, you, when, you, when you talk about, you know, getting them involved in technology transfer, what we have to realize from within the Sri Lankan context is that the, that the, the first two categories, I mean, they are a kind of a angry, you know, diaspora community. And uh, now if you try to, uh, implement uh, you know programs link to the the government the state so uh, you know there is going to be a problem and uh, so but uh, now uh, maybe those diaspora communities can contribute to to sri lanka i mean uh, uh, to to the country in different ways now if i take for example uh, during the war times we all know that you know a part of the Sri Lankan uh, diaspora community, the Sinhalese diaspora community, helped the war effort. And uh, in the same way, 
I think the Tamil diaspora community also help the other side, the LTT, right? So it is not necessarily a good thing to see, you know, technology transfer happening at any cost. I mean, there are some good technology transfer and bad technology transfer. Now, uh, so, so in, in that sense, I think we need to be, I mean, if you want to facilitate technology transfer, you know, to think about the, you know, bigger picture. I mean, we, there has to be a kind of a conducive environment, not only dual citizenships. There, had to, there has to be a kind of a, you know, democratic space and all these other, you know, components. And uh, if I give one example, now you took the example of uh, Global Forum of Sri Lankan Scientists. So I did a small search yesterday, and there is a group uh, called Green Energy Technology Group. That uh, I think that is the kind of closest group we can think of when we talk about uh, green economy. And there are 52 members of that group. Out of them, 48 are Sri Lankan people living in Sri Lanka. Uh, and uh, there are three people living outside, belonging to the diaspora community. And out of that, two are Sinhalese and one is Tamil. And there is another person, uh, Korean person in that group. So this, I, I think, uh, gives kind of a, you know, idea of, you know, how these exercises actually end, you know, end up. Because I think when you talk about green economy, it's a kind of a progressive idea. Now, at the moment, the diaspora communities are formed in such a way that there is a heavy, you know, ethnic and you know, uh, you know, religious bias. So, whether these groups are capable of, you know, contributing in a serious way, not capable. I mean, whether they are having a willingness to contribute in a serious way to uh, uh, an idea like, uh, you know, technology transfer is a questionable thing. I think. I would like to suggest alternatively that that uh, like-minded groups in other countries can be a uh, can be kind of more useful contact when it comes to issues like uh, techno technology transfer and green economy, because you know that requires kind of a different value system. So I think those are my two inputs. Thank you. Thank you, Dilipa, for the, those comments. Okay. So we now, uh, the, the floor is open. I think we've heard uh, two uh, uh, papers, which I'm not going to repeat, which, which are talking about some of the, tackling some of the crucial issues, re technology transfer and the, and the, and the, re and the related uh, uh, problems particularly, and, and uh, you know, suggesting uh, way forward in the second paper particularly. But also we've heard from the three discussant that you know, we, are, we are talking about technology transfer, and and where it why actually Dr. Kalegam was talking about why it, it worked and do, doesn't work to for us to understand the whole picture, while he agrees with the with the strategies, and particularly Dr. Malavadantri is talk uh, emphasized on the fact that technology transfer where we need to probably learn from where it worked in the past and not so much work not necessarily because of the regime uh, problem because it's it's more looking at, at things from more internal perspective and choosing what we want and then uh, Dilipa particularly highlighted the flexibilities and also was the 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 the, the assumptions behind the 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 strategy of using diaspora we, we thought you know in a way the assumption was diaspora is this homogeneous group that is you know how uh, they have come together with the interest common interest of uh, the country of origin and 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 the interest in development which is you know he argued that the case so in this this instance you know how do how we would more move forward in a in a in a in a more pragmatic manner is the is the question in front of us so the floor is open uh, if you state your name, and we, we take few uh, yeah. questions or clarification before we are asked. Yeah, I'm Faisal Samad. I'm a journalist based in Colombo. Uh, two quick points I would like to raise. Uh, the first point was on, on IPR. Uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization Director General is right now in Colombo, and he has been making some presentations. And yesterday, he raised a very interesting point at one of the presentations. Uh, he said the growth of technology 
the growth of internet and so on has been so tremendous that it's very difficult to control ideas now. And the point, the question he raises is that the debate right now is how do you, uh, how do you, who owns these ideas, the ownership of ideas, the ownership of decisions, and that's one of the big issues that is being confronted because it's just open there. Uh, now, how does that play in, in what we were discussing today? I mean, uh, because uh, these ideas can be taken by anyone, and, and if you look at uh, uh, cloud, cloud computing is a reservoir of ideas. Uh, the second point is on, on diaspora. Uh, I think in the Sri Lankan context, uh, one of the initial things that we need to do is that we still don't have a database of Sri Lankan professionals overseas uh, and, and their skills. Uh, that's one of the reasons and, and you know the skills and, and also whether they are available. And, and this essentially is not for the use of government only but for, for, for civil society. I'll, I'll give a very interesting example that was done uh, during the Sri Lankan peace process in 2002 when there was a ceasefire between the government and the Tamil Tigers organization. Uh, the uh, NGO linked to the LTT uh, had a very interesting model where they assembled a group of 200 expatriates with their skills. They had a workstation in, in the north and, and these people came on their own time. They, they, they paid for their own affairs, they were given a workstation, they developed programs and modules, and they became the team leaders, OCs. And it was done at their own time, but it was an interesting model, I thought, that if you can replicate it in the Sri Lankan context, where you have a lot of expatriates, you don't need to go into the long term of providing tax concessions and so on, because they are not going to come and work here. You catch them at the time that they visit families in the country. So there's time. You prepare a checklist of, of the time that the, the, the weeks or the, the days that they're coming to Sri Lanka and see, and then you have a checklist of organizations that need skills. And then you match the skills and say, okay, so and so is coming at this day. Can he give eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours of your time at no cost? And then you go to the next step of maybe on the long term looking at people coming and working on longer terms on the, on the question of the tax concessions, the flexible citizenship and so on. And, uh, and uh, the, the LTD ex example was, I thought, a great example. I mean, maybe for the wrong reason, but it was a fantastic example. They came, they had a fantastic workstation, so you could come in, you formed your teams, and you went back to wherever you were, and you directed these programs. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot. Taruka, you were the one who was yeah. uh, My name is Taruka Disanayake. I, uh, just a point to make now, as uh, I think all of us South Asian countries have developed for climate change technology needs assessments. Uh, I don't know if uh, Sudeep can uh, elaborate on whether there's any, you know, this often ends up at a, as a report uh, in the UNFCCC, so why we can't pick from that? Because there they, we do identify the needs we have in terms of uh, agriculture, water, sand, I mean, lots of things related to the MDGs, although it's climate change overall, but adaptation and mitigation both, so energy access. So lots of things related to the 2015 agenda is already there and already identified by these countries. So what can we do as a region to take it forward rather than ending it ending up, you know, as reports, um, I mean, waiting for a mechanism of transfer to happen internationally. Okay, uh, you want to? Thank you, and uh, thank you for excellent presentations and the discussions. Um, I was thinking that if uh, we could also recommend uh, in the agenda of funding research and technical skills uh, in the South, uh, uh, funding research of southern-based uh, research institutes um, to generate knowledge and evidence on outcome-based solutions to address extreme poverty, reduce maternal mortality, uh, improve education, um, imp and, and ensure environmental sustainability, and support gender and social group e equality on MDG. So promoting research and uh, technical knowledge as applied research on sustainable development will produce evidence and outcome-based solutions. 
Okay, thank you. And Andrew, I think you want to. Yeah, thank you very much. And Andrew Scott from the Overseas Development Institute. Um, th three observations, uh, more, than, more than questions. F firstly, uh, uh, thinking back onto the post-2015 process, uh, my impression has been that science, technology, and innovation has not been a highly featured topic of discussion under any of the, of the, the processes. It is on the agenda of the, the open working group in, in December, um, and I note there that the UN task team's uh, issues brief to that session um, does not really mention IPRs very much in its uh, areas of uh, interest for, for that discussion in, in terms of what the Open Working Group should take forward. Um, where there has been some discussion, and, and I recall about a year ago when the uh, UK Collaborative on Development Science was asked to produce a paper for the high-level panel on science and technology, uh, the focus there was on how scientific research could contribute to the high-level panel's work as opposed to implementation of a post-2015 agenda. Uh, and a lot of other discussions on science and technology have been around the use of information technology for the data collection and analysis that's going to be needed for more sophisticated monitoring of, of more sophisticated indicators. So I think there's, there's quite a lot of scope to, to, to contribute to that debate. Um, the, the second point, a little bit, is, is that um, when we're thinking about the the subject, we, we need to, I think, a little about the, the sort of narrative that lies behind some of the thinking on science and technology. Um, yesterday we were talking a lot about uh, sustainability and, and part of the thinking there in terms of the role of science and technology is that technology is going to solve all our problems and therefore we can both have our cake of growth uh, and eat it in terms of having a sustainable environment. Um, and I think that there may be some, some risks for all of us if, if we put too much reliance into that. Um, the th third point is, is that, uh, again, part of that narrative certainly traditionally has been that the, the North has the technology and, and, the, and the South um, has, uh, if you like, a right to, to access it. Um, in fact, increasingly, the North doesn't have the technology. Um, uh, when we're thinking about information technology and green technologies, it, it's going to be countries like the BRICS countries, uh, and we all know what the I stands for in, in BRICS, uh, that, that are going to be the source of, of technology. Uh, and increasingly, those countries are tightening up uh, their, their IPR regimes. <coughs> um, so so the, 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 the question there is, is, is a little bit, need to be sort of thinking a little bit beyond some of the maybe conventional thinking about, about this subject. Uh, and finally, uh, a, a, a comment in, in that I, I'm not sure how important the IPR debate is for this. Uh, I think when we're thinking about uh, what might be said in terms of implementation of the post-2015 agenda, um, it may be thinking more about what national science and technology and innovation policies and strategies need to be in order to deliver that agenda rather than some of the, the, the conventional areas of debate around technology transfer and IPRs. Oh, thanks. Uh, Dr. Lena Gidra, and maybe then after that. Uh, I'm Dr. Mulita Lena uh, Director of National Science and Technology Commission, which is a policy body uh, in the field of science and technology. And uh, I, have, I want to highlight two things uh, with regard to the two presentations. One is the technology transfer. Uh, I think in, when you are working in the practical way on the ground, we have to consider technology transfer in, uh, under three items. One is technology transfer within the country, that is locally developed technology transfer into the local people. The second one is technology embedded in FDI, like uh, between among the countries. The third thing is uh, local inventions and uh, technology developments. So what I think that we should consider these three things uh, should work hand in hand and in parallel. Otherwise, we may not be able to uh, transfer the technology in a sustainable way and in a way that, that gives a significant impact on Sri Lankan's economy. So that is one thing uh, with regard to technology transfer. The second point is regarding the diaspora as an enabler 
for the local uh, economic development. I can highlight one ju uh, just one example. In Sri Lanka's uh, nanotechnology initiative is one good example, uh, a successful example for uh, diaspora support. I mean, it is not uh, fully diaspora supported, but there was a component that the diaspora helped Sri Lanka, especially the expatriate Sri Lankan scientists, help Sri Lanka to initiate the nanotechnology. And that is the story. Recently, we have opened the nanotechnology uh, Sri Intech uh, new complex at uh, uh, Homagam. So uh, finally, the, from the side of government, the then Science and Technology Ministry has developed Science, Technology and Innovation Strategy for Sri Lanka. That was uh, in 2011, and that was for, for the period 2011 to 2015. And the implementation of that strategy, I have the document with me. May, maybe uh, you may aware or you may not aware of, about this document. And the implement when it comes comes to the implementation, it has not been uh, a successful story. But uh, organizations like NGOs like Practical Action or Poverty. SEPA uh, can take a leading role in implementing the recommendations given in these documents rather than the government. Government may support, but it is still uh, these organizations can help to take these uh, uh, science, technology, and innovation strategies forward and to the ground level. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. I think uh, there are some, I'll come back to you all. I think I'll give. Uh, our uh, uh, presenters a chance to respond to this first round of question. Uh, Mr. Gopu Kumar, you know, Dilipa's question also, keep that in mind. Yeah. I think um, uh, quickly responding to uh, Dilip's uh, question, uh, definitely this uh, uh, flexibility is, uh, <coughs> are available and uh, it can be used for uh, various types of uh, technological needs, including the... It's not working? Okay. Yeah, it's working. Yeah. Uh, including the uh, green technology needs. But how are uh, the problems are of four types? Uh, the first problem is that many of these countries have not incorporated these uh, flexibilities in their domestic law. Second, if they incorporate it, the moment uh, that they may not have the manufacturing capabilities in some of these technologies. So therefore, uh, they won't be able to use. The one classic case is of medicines, like only around 40 countries having the manufacturing capability in medicines. So if they issue a compulsory license, they have to depend on some other country to source that product. And thirdly, uh, there might be domestic pressure also. It's not that, you know, like the pharmaceutical companies or the IP owners who are working uh, country may oppose these things, uh, some of these. Uh, and lastly, um, you need uh, also political will in the sense uh, you might be under pressure from uh, international uh, 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 no, uh, actors, uh, including uh, the uh, uh, host countries of some of these, uh, uh, sorry, home countries of uh, some of these transnational corporations. So, there are ample evidence for that. So, uh, so you might receive uh, letters or the requests, etc., from the foreign ambassadors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, you, so these are some of the problems. But definitely, you can use that. And secondly, coming to this uh, question of um, uh, whether IPR is figuring in the uh, uh, in the post 2015 debates, uh, it's there, but it's much more in a uh, in a dormant way. I think the, when the nego uh, negotiation moves forward, and if there is a dedicated discussion on uh, science and technology in December in the SDG framework, I think it's going to resurface. Uh, the, till now, there is only one uh, uh, piece, uh, the think piece came out on IP, science, technology, uh, science, innovation, and IP in 2012. Uh, but then from that picture, things started moving slowly. When you look at the uh, ECOSOC uh, ministerial conference declaration, etc., IPR has <coughs> been repeatedly mentioned there but uh, slightly different context, actually. They also recognize the role of IPR in fo foreign direct investment, etc. I don't know how it <coughs> appeared there, uh, but it's there. Um, and lastly, when we talk about IPR, IPR is, uh, uh, is, uh, is an issue only when it comes to a kind of two types of technologies, in the sense that there are certain technologies which is already available in the public domain. IPR is not going to affect that kind of uh, transfer of those technologies. It may affect 
the new technology which we are going to develop there are uh, technological gaps in certain areas where the new technologies are going to come these technologies are going to come with ipr protection and if there it is protected through ipr then it creates a barrier for uh, transfer and secondly there are certain technologies which improvements happens because the uh, the way in which the countries started granting patents uh, especially in the developed countries there is a dilution of standards therefore you can get a, um, a patent on anything there is a patent for a, a dog's cap uh, so there are a lot of funny patents actually someone even got a patent in australia for wheel uh, you know which is invented long back so, <laughs> so uh, these kind of so whenever you make an improvement <coughs> it comes out uh, on uh, comes with an ip protection so on these two <coughs> contexts ipr is going to create a problem um, so, in terms of like the last, uh, in, um, lastly, I would say that uh, there are ways and means to uh, 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 to negotiate these IP barriers. Uh, so, uh, so one of the uh, issues that, like in the medicine context, what we have a essential list of medicine. So, the government procure essential list of uh, essential lists. That's a compulsory procurement. Then, uh, so there is a we we have an essential list of medicines. But when it comes to water uh, water technologies, access to safe water, we don't have a list of essential technologies. Or when it comes to uh, reproductive health, we don't have an, a list of essential technologies. Okay, but uh, on um, mother and uh, maternity health and, uh, uh, and and also child health is concerned, the WHO is coming out with a essential list of uh, medicines. So some of these things can be done, and in a way we can uh, ensure that then if any of these technologies are IP protected, then you can use the flexibilities and to make it in the public domain. So stop it. Sorry, uh, with regard to Mr. Dilipa, Dilipa's question regarding the fragmentation or the segregation of uh, diaspora itself, we need to keep in mind that you know. But uh, one of the, I mean, one of my thought is usually in South East, South South Asia. I mean, I, I'm speaking from the Nepalese experience. We do not, we do not have the record of uh, firstly people who go abroad for you know employment, but most about mostly about students who have gone abroad and gotten education there, and they are like skilled labor. We don't have any information as to how many, how many number, like what are the skills, where are they working. So that, that voided information is actually preventing a lot of interaction, you know. So we don't know what our diaspora is doing. And there is like, and, and due to the lack of initiatives as well uh, from the government, like the, the people who are already abroad are losing their interest to connect to, the, to your origin countries, and which is going to be a major problem, you know, you know, if you don't address it right now, because I mean, eventually, if this, if they are only going abroad to get higher education, not contributing to local development, I mean, that is a, that is total brain drain, and there's no gain at all. And eventually, it will be difficult for us to even to communicate or to find diaspora members. So I think in this regard, I mean, though there are members of the community which you know, for various reasons, may not be willing to contribute, it is important for us to seek those who are willing to contribute. And to do that, we need data revolution, basically gathering of data like right now we have ministries in uh, Bangladesh India Pakistan and Sri Lanka did, uh, like you know dedicated to uh, immigration but they are, they are only concerned about how to send people abroad what are the problems not about how to bring them back and that should be a focus you know like you can't just send everybody abroad and be like we're happy on remittance which comes back obviously but you know most of more, more than 50 percent of it is consumed in basic consumption so there is no investment through that through that department as well so we need to consider that just remittance is not enough in that regard. So we need to figure out a way how to, how to, how to get that data and how to link them, how we can connect them uh, for development. And uh, with regard to uh, 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 Ms. Uh, Taruka's question regarding regional agreements and climate change, uh, there have been significant headway in regard to regional agreements, uh, most importantly the Thimpu st statement on climate change. Which is very compli I mean, which is a very good uh, adaptation uh, statement. However, uh, it, it is just a mere rhetor rhetoric. What he says is it reinforces that this this department is going to do this. That department already exists. It only states that okay, uh, the meteorological department is going to take care of some weather, but it doesn't say what next to do because that department has already existed, and they are doing the same thing. And that the, all the statement says is that we're going to we're going to this department is going to take care of it. But how will they take care of it? What is going to be different? What is going to be different? Of
not been addressed by such regional uh, initiatives. Furthermore, I mean, especially thin boost statement on climate change, uh, they have not decided to allocate any funds. So they say we're going to take care of it, and that's it. And everybody's happy, like, oh, we achieved something, you know, but we didn't, because there is no commitment. And it's so thus far, it is, I mean, that has been one of the most, uh, you know, uh, uh, pr the, the problem with the, thin the, the regional efforts to you know, mitigate mitigation or adaptation efforts to climate change is that it has just been a mere rhetoric. You know, the food bank, the uh, regional food bank has failed because of, you know it's also been a mere rhetoric for, uh, uh, despite being signed many years ago, created many years ago. So these are the things that we cannot just do it on paper. We need to take the initiative. Like we, we can't say that this department take care of it, but like we need to have a plan as to how, what is going to be the exact step. Who's going to fund it? You know, what's the contribution? So that com again comes down to negotiation as to how it's going to happen. So I mean, that that takes care of most of that. That is the situation of our regional agreements as far as uh, climate change is concerned. Uh, uh, okay. Shall we then move to the next uh, the next few minutes? I to focus this discussion. Uh, we we only have few minutes. So let's come back to ending from uh, where Sudeep, uh, you know, kind of ended. You know, what is the local agenda? And uh, has, uh, Andrew also highlighted but probably that is what is most important for us. Now, Dr. Leon Kedra said for, for Sri Lanka, for example, we have a strategy up until 2015. Now, what is going to be the strategy post-2015? How are we going to do that? And what, what, what should be the, the key elements of these national strategies uh, so that, uh, you know, we, and, and then, then if, uh, until and unless we understand the, the, the importance of it, you know, we will not be able to uh, you know, leverage much uh, within the space that is available in, in December, for example. So, so anybody wants to make a comment on that? Yeah. Madam Chairman, I'd just like to add uh, two points onto that. If you take Sri Lanka, if you want to look at two things, in my mind it is energy, number one, and all issues around it and how to do improve it. Second one is that unexplored all the sea around Sri Lanka. Yeah, okay. So in the, uh, so would, uh, in the South Asian context, uh, uh, I think uh, we should look at, uh, uh, of course, we should look at the technologies related to water, health, uh, uh, and many other things. But most importantly, we should also focus on the industrial technology, how you can uh, how you can, uh, in a way, imitate uh, in a smart way by passing the IP and imitate these technologies and use that and increase the uh, industrialization process as well as to increase the quality of jobs uh, instead of, uh, uh, you know, uh, still uh, exporting the commodities. So we should move to much more, uh, the exports uh, component should have much more technological content uh, from this region. Um, I'm Gunnar Ruan from Colombo University. Um, it's an interesting discussion going on regarding the technology and uh, how uh, we can address the, uh, the, the issues of developing world. Um, I would probably like to uh, see this problem um, at an economic angle. And uh, I see that it is basically, uh, we probably have to go back to the pre-tea session to see whether the whole thing is cropping up because of our economic model, which is wrong. So we have been discussing about uh, sustainable development model, and if you relate uh, it to I see a big uh, kind of mismatch there. Firstly, uh, the problem of uh, delinking uh, the, the uh, technology, investment on technology, the, the ownership and the price of the technical product that itself is uh, bringing up a big issue of uh, the market economics. How do you do that? The moment you do that, there won't be investment in technology. On the other hand, if you link it to technology, then, uh, I mean, marketability is going to be a problem of that. So people will not be able to procure the products, the, 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 the technological output, unless, you know, you're you are offering them at a, a marketable price. So it appears like uh, this, while agreeing that this uh, issue is important, given the uh, existing economic model, how do we do that? Now, one way is we, 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 uh, when we discuss uh, the, the technological issue I see, is that technology itself is, it appears to be it's anti-poor, the way it is going on today. 
technology itself is anti-poor because the person who is having access to technology is having an edge over the others. So technology uh, is giving the power uh, to uh, people, if you have it, to overpower the others and have an economic edge. So that gives kind of a power to technology to be uh, uh, parceled as a marketable product. And that's where the edge is coming up for the investors to go up and develop technology and sell it out. Now, is it possible for us to get technology out of the marketable product paradigm? I think that's the crux of the matter. If we can address that issue and to bring uh, 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 technology out of this, uh, uh, this marketable product concept, I think the problem can be addressed in a big way. Unfortunately, when we have these kind of problems, we seek refuge in the market economies itself. Now, for example, when we go to environment and we say, well, environment is degraded, environment is a problem now because of you know, our economic activity, environment is damaged. Here we see a problem within the market economy by trying to make the environment products a marketable thing and trying to see, well, okay, you can now have, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, these things can be, uh, you know, uh, give tradable permits or give marketable permits or uh, environmental services have a market and let's price it. And when you have property rights, you can get uh, environmental uh, uh, resources protected. I think the market economy itself is the crux of the problem. And we seek, try to seek refuge in that problem itself. I don't think we, we are going to have a solution found anywhere in that kind of a you know, infernal cycle going from the market economy to the market economy by trying to seek this problem. Secondly, why don't we look into our own models? I think one of the problems in uh, technology is the economies of scale. Those days, simple things were used in local, domestic, homestead, villages. All those things got lost when the communities got integrated into countries and later into the global paradigm because large scale production of things became cheaper and you wipe out the, the domestic small scale things that you developed in our uh, traditional villages. Where the Mahatya got out of business when you had uh, large scale uh, drugs coming in uh, to the to the to the to the market, and then uh, even our small scale technologies, our hand looms, our, our uh, uh, other all other uh, you know domestic based things got out of the business. When I was young, we were taking uh, uh, you know um, we were going to uh, the polar and bringing things in a uh, pole cola basket at home, which is lost today because there are large scale production of uh, packaging. Uh, things in a, in, a, in, a, in a big way. So here, I think economies of scale itself is a problem. Can we go back to small economies? And can we go back to our own solutions? For instance, I am not richer than my father, though I have a car and I have a telephone and I have all these things. My father who did not have a telephone and a, a car and he only had a push bike. I think I am poorer than him because we have gone into a different paradigm of needs also. So we need better technology and we chase after technology and technology uh, itself is used to chase after wealth and the, the whole infernal cycle is uh, taking into the toll. So let me suggest, I mean, not, not maybe not this forum, but let me suggest that we get out of this economic paradigm and then probably we might have a better solution. Yes, thank you. I need to come back to this because of the, uh, sorry I missed the start of that, but the technology and uh, economic model infernal cycle. Um, the, forgive my ignorance on this, but the free and open source software movement as a model as well as uh, creative commons licensing and things like that. I'm sorry, I don't know enough examples of it being used very positively or impactfully in sustainability and uh, poverty alleviation and that kind of work. Uh, the people here might be able to share some of that. But I think there's a lot of outside that uh, that economic model. There is a lot of potential. I believe it's been done very successfully in software, in the software industry, and uh, in technology. And also, there are examples. I mean, the nature of, for example, the pharma industry is that you need the Viagra's and the Lipitor's to keep the companies running. But at the same time, I believe it was Merck or some other uh, big pharma company that 
they did almost open source some of the research they had done. It might not be that incentives can pull pull that kind of activity, but you know I, I don't recall if it was river blindness or what. But there were there were uh, big examples as well as the, there are small examples of them putting some of their horsepower to use for the actually uh, market failure kind of what would otherwise be market failure situations. So I was going to keep quiet, but I wanted to bring that up now since uh, I heard that going around. Especially if we can focus on, I mean, there are other, you may not have heard of Benetech and ID Ventures and other organizations that do a lot of grassroots, um, a lot of public, I don't know if public good is the right thing, but I mean, um, work that they put out there uh, in the public domain for, for people to, to use. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know enough to share about them scaling. Right, I think, I don't know whether there is anybody who want to make one last comment. If not, I think we need to bring this session to a conclude. Certainly, you know, we haven't sorted out all our problems. I think... Uh, Can I make a comment? Yes. Yeah, one brief, two brief comments. Uh, one is about this open source. Uh, uh, it's not about, not, not only about software. I think this open uh, idea has to be like promoted like open access. And uh, now there is this open architecture and you know open technology yes. and everything. So that idea can be the kind of you know uh, the solution for the future. And uh, when it comes to uh, my colleagues, uh, Gunaruan's uh, comment, I think the lists list seem getting longer now. Earlier, we, uh, people were asking uh, to get the education out of the market, then the health out of the market, and now <laughs> you are suggesting to get technology also out of the market. I think that I think that. That means that you know we need a kind of a discussion on market, maybe not as this forum, but you know at somewhere we have to start that discussion, whether the market is going to help us. Uh, just uh, you know, market is there or not? That is the question. But the state has an obligation under the uh, international covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights to ensure that the progress of science and techno enjoyment to ensure people enjoy the progress of science and technology. So there is something concept which is. Uh, developing rapidly called right to science. Uh, so uh, that's a uh, that's a good way of uh, uh, looking at it. Uh, so the state has to place policies to ensure that the benefit goes to the people should enjoy the benefit of science and technology. And lastly, on the open source thing, it's also replicated in pharmaceuticals. Um, in the continent itself, subcontinent itself, uh, the government of India program called uh, open source drug discovery on TB, it's looking at it, uh, to develop a new drug for TB. So it's a platform where in which people are, uh, they, uh, they post the so, uh, problems and the people are uh, coming together and uh, give solutions. So it's a model to worth look at it. Regarding the state coming in, I have my serious doubts given the fact that uh, the states that we have in this part of the world uh, uh, might be even worse than the private sector getting into it. <laughs> because they would probably want uh, 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 better kind of profits than, uh, than, than private sector doing uh, uh, themselves. Now that's where my, my worry is. But I agree, if, if state can be the promoter only and then let the marketable part, commercial part, or whatever done by the private sector. Then again, coming into the problem, who is going to finance, bear the shoulder, the burden of uh, 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 the investment, which is going to go into technology development? Now, that might cause a worse problem, because state, at the expense of the poor man's tax, developing the products, and making it marketed through private sector, and uh, the, the, the rich people are benefited of it. So this is a kind of a, another infernal cycle that we've got to uh, consider. I mean, as long as we have good governance, so again we go back to the morning session, mm -hmm. trying to find out a, pro a solution to good governance, I think we have pro solutions to many, many of our problems. Well, okay. maybe another addi addi addition so to the list. Yeah, so we have a lot of chicken and egg situations here, which comes first. But I think we need to bring this session to a close closure now. I am not going to summarize uh, what we have discussed here, but I just wanted to emphasize that, you know, we really need to focus on what we can do and where we can intervene 
at the moment in this in the post SDG discussions. And the space we have is local, uh, you know, unlike in the MD, it's not prescriptive. They're saying that have flexibility, develop local agendas. Let's focus on that. And if we can really focus on that and our stakeholders understand the stake in it, not only for you know the general society, but particularly for majority of the poor. And if we can do something, at least that agenda is right. And then we can think of all the other tools and methodologies to influence, do put the right, so where we need to start, where, you know, with what we have and the space to influence. So that is something I would like for us to think about and leave this thought with you. And of course, the debate needs to continue. We have some time till 2015, some time till December 2013. So we let's, let's continue the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much to all the um, uh, presenters, chair, panelists.